Emily, it's urgent. My dad apparently fell at work and broke his leg. I'm worried, so I'm going back to my hometown for a while starting tomorrow to take care of him. That was the call I received from my husband, Joe, while I was out dining. My father-in-law lives alone in a remote rural area, and he's not exactly young anymore, so it's certainly a concern. But what's going on here? Right in front of me, the father-in-law who supposedly just broke his leg finished a ultimate double cheeseburger with great vigor. He doesn't seem injured at all. I had a lot of questions, but I thought it wouldn't help to have a long conversation right now, so I just told Joe I understood. That's worrying. Got it. Could you tell me more when things settle down? My father-in-law, seeing my puzzled expression as I ended the call, spoke up with concern. What's the matter, Emily? Who was on the phone? Well, Joe just called. He said you broke your leg and that he's going back to take care of you for a while. My father-in-law, Bob, seemed surprised too, but after a moment he said, I don't know why Joe would say something like that, but for now, it's better not to dig too deep. Do you think Joe has some reason for lying? Well, overthinking it now won't do us any good. Let's ask Joe when he gets back. For now... Let's forget about it and have a drink. How about I treat you to a beer? I don't know what to do from here, but I can't just ignore the fact that Joe lied. First, I've got to find out why he lied. My name is Emily. I moved to New York when I married Joe, who works at a trading company in the city, and we were blessed with a lovely son, Aiden. I had friends who didn't get along well with their in-laws, so I was worried about how I'd fare. But to my relief, my relationship with my in-laws was much better than I'd feared. After Aiden was born, we visited Joe's parents in Nebraska every two months, and they helped us with childcare. Now Aiden has grown up, graduated college, and moved out, so we don't go back as often but we still visit every Thanksgiving and Christmas. Bob learned the trade of construction when he was young and, even at 80, still works as a foreman. He has more apprentices who look up to him, and he always boasted it felt like his family was growing. My mother-in-law was a homemaker, tirelessly supporting him from early morning till late at night. Even as he aged, Bob's appetite never waned, and he ate as much as his young apprentices. It's tough to cook every day. I can still remember my mother-in-law's face, looking troubled yet somehow happy as she spoke. But a few months ago, she suddenly passed away. After her death, Bob visibly lost his energy and became withdrawn. He couldn't even muster the energy to go to work, and his apprentices voiced their concerns to me. Ever since I married Joe, Bob welcomed me warmly, even after our son was born. I was worried about leaving him alone in this state, so I talked to Joe about having him live with us. Joe, your dad has been down since your mom passed. I think it'd be good if he lived with us. Yeah. He's already 80. Maybe this is the right time for him to retire and take it easy. Joe agreed, so I planned to bring it up with Bob when the moment was right. But a few days later, Joe told me he'd been offered a promotion at work. Emily, listen, I've been promoted to manager starting next month. It'll mean more work and more business trips. I know it'll put more on your plate, but I'll do my best. He had rarely come home on time before, and now it seemed he was going to be even busier. I'm not as young as I used to be, and to be honest, I'm a bit worried about caring for Bob alone. His promotion was great news, a result of Joe's hard work. I wanted to support Joe as he spoke so excitedly. In the end, months passed without me being able to bring up the idea of living together with Bob. 
Joe successfully became the manager and got busier than expected. As I had feared, he came home even later. Sometimes, he'd come back after I'd already gone to bed. Weekends, too, were taken up with business golf or trips, so Joe spent less time at home. I felt bad for my father-in-law, but I knew I couldn't take care of him alone in this situation. Telling myself it was for the best not to raise the idea and burden him, I pushed the thought away. About a year had passed since my mother-in-law passed away when I got a message from Bob. Sorry for worrying you for so long. I've recovered and went back to work quite some time ago. Now I'm working energetically with my apprentices. Reading those words, I felt relieved and suggested visiting him at his place for the first time in a while. However, he said he had decided to take a break from work for a bit and wanted to come here to relax, so we decided to go out for hamburger at his request. Since Joe's promotion, I'd gotten used to eating alone, so I was excited to have someone to dine with for a change. When Bob showed up at the station where we had arranged to meet, he was completely well and I was touched. We went into a nearby diner and were happily reminiscing about my mother-in-law and talking about work when my phone rang with a call from Joe. I wondered what it could be and answered the call. Emily, it's urgent. Dad apparently fell at work and broke his leg. He can't work for a while and he seems unable to manage daily life either. So I'm worried. I'll be going back to his house tomorrow to take care of him. What is he talking about? My father-in-law just finished a huge double cheeseburger right in front of me with great energy. We had walked to the restaurant from the station and he showed no signs of being injured. And for someone whose parents supposedly got injured, Joe didn't sound all that panicked. I had a lot of questions, but I knew a long conversation right now wouldn't help, so I just told Joe I understood. That's worrying. All right, go ahead and be with him. Could you let me know more details when things settle down? Yeah, of course. I hate to trouble you, but his doctor said it will take two months to heal, so I'll have to leave you alone for a while. Joe replied as if he was unaware of how I felt. I'm out right now, but I'll pack your things when I get home. When I said that, Joe sounded somewhat flustered. Oh, right. You're not home now. Well, there's no need to rush back. I'll pack and leave tonight. What is Joe hiding? Seeing my anxious expression after hanging up, Bob spoke up with concern. What's the matter, Emily? Who was on the phone? Well, Joe just called. He said you broke your leg and that he's going back to take care of you for a while. Bob also looked surprised, but after thinking for a while, he said, I don't know why Joe would say such a thing, but for now, it's best not to pry. Does Joe have some reason to lie? Well, something's not quite right. But let's wait and hear it from Joe when he gets back. The uneasy feeling wouldn't go away, but I was glad Bob was with me. If I were alone, I might not have been able to handle this anxiety. Well, thinking about it now won't change anything. For today, let's just have a drink and forget about this. How about I treat you to a beer? I felt like I was making Bob worry instead. I chuckled awkwardly, accepted his offer of beer, and downed it in one go. The bitterness spread through my mouth, washing away a bit of my unease, and I felt slightly better. After a few more drinks, we both ended up happily tipsy and headed home. When we arrived, the house was dark. Joe had already left. Seeing the dark room, I felt the alcohol leave my system. Even though I'd asked him to let me know when things settled down, I hadn't heard from Joe since. Bob said he had some reasons that prevented him from returning to the countryside for the time being, 
so he decided to stay at our place until Joe returned. He didn't say it, but I think he was worried about me since I still looked so uneasy. After I got used to having Bob around, Joe finally contacted me to say he was coming home. As I vaguely realized that two months had passed, I had a bad feeling and felt uneasy about facing Joe alone, so I asked Bob to watch over us from the room next to the living room. Joe came home at 9 p.m. Welcome back. How's Dad doing? It must have been tough with work and all. Work's finally settled down. As for Dad... Joe spoke with his eyes cast downward. I held my breath, waiting for what he'd say next. Actually, Dad's leg healed, but it seems his injury was worse than I thought, and now he can't walk properly. So he's going to a care facility, and I'll need to visit him often, going back to his place. Before Joe could finish, the door to the next room swung open. Joe, what are you talking about? I didn't break my leg, nor did I hear anything about going to a care facility. I've been here with Emily this whole time for the past two months. Where have you been going without me at home? Bob scolded Joe with intense anger. Dad, what are you doing here? Joe, who hadn't expected to see his father there, was left speechless his mouth opening and closing like a fish. Emily, you tricked me. Joe, ignoring his own lies, lashed out at me. Joe, I don't know why you use me as an excuse to lie, but yelling at Emily is not right, is it? Stay out of this, Dad. This is between me and Emily. And why are you even here? Though Bob stepped in to defend me, Joe's anger was still directed at me. I heard that Bob's house was leaking badly and undergoing renovation. He wanted to do it himself, but his apprentices insisted on helping him. When you called me saying he'd broken his leg, I was actually with him. Gosh, then why didn't you say you were with him then? Joe, weren't you the one who lied first? You haven't been home for two months, but if you'd come back even once, you might have noticed. I, I mean. Joe was finally at a loss for words. Then Bob pushed further. Where have you been for the last two months? I never received any word from the apprentices that you came back. Well, actually, I was at Aiden's place. He had something he needed to talk about that he couldn't tell Emily. I had no choice but to say I was going to Dad's. Joe piled on another lie. It was obvious this was a lie too, and I had a reason to know that. I was about to confront Joe's shameless excuses in front of his own father when Aiden came home. I'm back. Wait, Dad? You're here? Aiden, why are you here? Aiden came back because he was worried about me and Bob living alone. He stayed with us for the two months you were gone. Aiden, Joe said he was at your place for the last two months. Did you ever get any notice of that? Huh? No, Dad never said anything about coming over. Besides, I have my house keys with me, so he couldn't get in anyway. Aiden's testimony sealed the matter. Joe couldn't escape the truth now. He was backed into a corner. No, I was definitely at Aiden's. You guys are just misunderstanding. You're all plotting against me. Seeing Joe ranting nonsensically, I felt strangely calm and showed him the screen of my phone. It displayed pictures of a young woman and a newborn baby. Do you recognize this woman? Well, well. Joe's face turned pale. It seems you were indeed at our son's place for two months, but this isn't our child. I didn't want to say this in front of Aiden, but were you cheating on me? She's just my co-worker. If you're saying I had an affair, prove it. Joe brazenly demanded. I slapped down the disturbing emails I'd received in front of Joe. 
This is the proof of your affair with this woman. My phone displayed numerous messages from Joe's mistress. I'm the one Joe really loves. Just leave him. Even at work, Joe is all over me. Joe said he prefers a young and beautiful woman like me over an old, wrinkled wife. The baby was born the other day. Looks just like Joe and me. Although the messages didn't include any pictures of the baby, they mentioned habits and physical features of Joe that only I, his wife, would know, making it impossible to dismiss them as just the mistress's fantasies. She probably thought that if she had a child, I would divorce Joe. Dad, were you lying and having an affair when Mom and Grandpa were going through so much? Joe, you even have a child? No! Unable to bear it anymore, Joe grabbed only his wallet and phone and bolted out of the house. An awkward silence hung in the air, but Aiden and Bob spoke up in bright voices. Well, Mom, you haven't done anything wrong. Let's just forget about today and get some sleep. That's right. Aiden's right. Emily, let me handle the cleanup today. Grateful for their kindness, I decided to turn in early for the night. However, the next day, a heap of nasty letters from Joe's mistress arrived. The mailbox was overflowing with paper, scribbled messily with hateful words. Don't think you can just panic now that Joe's about to dump you. Don't be jealous just because you're not the one he loves. Why don't you face reality and just give up? Stop clinging to your high-earning husband and get a divorce now. There was no sender's name, but it was clear who had written them. There were at least 30 letters. Apparently, after Joe stormed out of the house yesterday, he went to his mistress's place. He must have lashed out at her for contacting me. It seemed like the mistress was desperate to justify herself unable to accept being scolded by Joe. I didn't want to further exhaust myself over something that wasn't my fault. When I consulted Bob, he advised me to contact a lawyer, so I went straight to a law office. After consulting with the lawyer, it was decided that we would demand alimony from both Joe and his mistress, inform the mistress that any further communication must go through the lawyer, and ignore any attempts to contact me directly. But the next day, Joe and the mistress showed up at the house together. It seemed they were upset about the demand for alimony. Ignoring the instruction to go through the lawyer, they barged into my home. Who do you think has been putting food on the table all this time while you've been just a housewife with no job? If you want to demand alimony from us, I won't be sending you any money for living expenses from now on. Joe tried to use money to threaten me, but in reality, he hadn't contributed to living expenses at all during the two months he was supposedly back home. During that time, we had been living off Bob's and my savings, but with Aiden grown up and having moved out, I was thinking it might be time to start a part-time jobs. It didn't matter if Joe stopped sending money. We could manage our lives on our own. Understood. I don't need the living expenses, so I'll go ahead with the alimony claim. Joe seemed taken aback by how easily I agreed, but still unwilling to pay alimony. He hesitated for a moment before saying, Have you forgotten what I've done to raise Aiden? You couldn't have sent him to college on your own. It's true that Joe's earnings allowed Aiden to go to college, but I handled all the support at home. Joe hadn't raised Aiden by himself. I didn't mind being criticized, but when it came to child rearing, I had my pride. Being told that I couldn't have properly raised Aiden without him shattered that pride. I bit my lip in frustration, and Bob yelled at Joe in my defense. You didn't raise him on your own. Aiden grew up well because Emily was there to support him. And if you're going to boast about raising your kid, 
Remember that it's thanks to me that you grew up to be who you are. But I sure didn't raise you to be a cheater. Joe, who was now being scolded by his parent in front of his mistress, couldn't say a word and hung his head. His mistress, standing next to him, tried to defend him. Wait a minute, Bob. However, Bob shot back. You have no right to call me by my first name, leaving both of them hanging their heads in shame. Seeing this, I placed the completed divorce papers in front of Joe. I had thought about divorcing him when the mistress contacted me. If Joe had admitted to his affair and shown genuine remorse, I would have considered giving him another chance. But instead, he lied on top of lies and then had the nerve to lash out at me. I was already prepared. Joe hadn't expected a divorce and quickly tried to defend himself. Emily, please reconsider. It was just a moment of weakness. I don't care about this woman. I'll make it right, and we can keep going as a couple. Hearing this, the mistress standing beside him flew into a rage. Wait a minute. What are you saying? You promised you'd leave her and be with me. You said you couldn't see her as a woman anymore. Are you telling me you lied to me too? It was a momentary lapse. I never intended to be with you. But we already have a child. What are you going to do about this? I couldn't afford to have them start fighting here. Joe refused to sign the divorce papers no matter how many times I asked. But eventually, Bob told him to sign it, so he reluctantly picked up a pen. Slowly, he filled in the necessary details, and after making sure everything was completed, I kicked Joe and his mistress out of the house. However, the two showed no intention of leaving. Joe was banging on the front door, begging to be let in, while the mistress yelled at him loudly. Emily, let me in. Listen to me. Hey, we're not done here. How dare you trick me? I'm going to sue you for marriage fraud. Hearing their loud commotion at the front door, Bob called the police as it was becoming a disturbance to the neighbors. A few minutes later, hearing the police sirens, the two finally realized they were in trouble and fled the scene. Bob and I looked at each other, relieved as we glanced at the now quiet front door. After that, Joe kept trying to contact me to reject the divorce, but I ignored him and submitted the divorce papers. I then had my lawyer demand alimony again, and when Joe still refused, I told him, If you refuse again, I'll take you to court. In that case, I'll have your salary garnished. Finally, he seemed to give up and agreed to pay the alimony. Perhaps Joe feared that a midlife divorce would damage his reputation at work, especially now that he had been promoted to manager. He was a very proud man. Three months passed after our divorce, and I received several calls from Joe. Even after all this, he still couldn't follow the instruction to contact me through my lawyer. As I was about to turn off my phone to ignore him, another call came in. Of course, it was from Joe. Not wanting my call log to be filled with missed calls, I decided to answer. Hello, what do you want now? Emily, someone I don't know is living in my family home. What's going on? It seemed that Joe had been abandoned by his mistress and had nowhere to go so he decided to return to his family home. But when he got there, he found strangers living in what he thought was his house, and they turned him away. Oh, remember when I said your dad's house was undergoing repairs due to severe leaks? Well, the repairs are done, but after living with us, your dad felt it would be too much to live alone in the countryside. So, he decided to sell the house and move in with me. What? I wasn't told about this? You sold my house without my permission. Joe yelled in rage, but I calmly replied. 
If you'd actually returned to the family home even once, you would have noticed the renovations and the sale. You didn't notice because you were lying. This is your own doing. Also, when you say, my house is, it was actually built in your dad's name. Since he agreed to sell it, there was no issue. I hung up the phone before Joe could respond. Soon after, I got a letter from the mistress. She ignored the directive to contact me through my lawyer and sent the letter directly to me. It was full of self-centered claims that she was the victim, arguing it was wrong for me to demand alimony from her and that she should be the one asking for it. Considering all the vile messages she had sent me before, it was outrageous for her to play the victim now. I ignored her demands and sent her a folder containing all the emails she had sent. This is what you did. Face reality and pay the appropriate alimony. I also informed my lawyer, who warned both Joe and the mistress not to contact me directly again. One day, after some peaceful time had passed, I received a message from the mistress's parents. I was tired of dealing with this mess, but they said they wanted to apologize for what had happened. They were her parents, after all. Even if they claimed to apologize, they might become upset. Worried, I consulted Bob and arranged to meet with them later, with my lawyer present. At a cafe, the mistress's parents were already seated, and unlike their daughter, they were serious and sensible people. They apologized to me profusely. Well, what happened to them after that? Since I hadn't heard from Joe or her since then, I asked her parents. They exchanged awkward glances before explaining what had happened. According to them, the mistress had barged into Joe's family home. However, the person living there was a complete stranger, and, like Joe, they were surprised by the visit. The resident, suspicious of being approached by strangers, consulted the police. Afterward, the police patrolled the area, and the mistress, who was lingering around the house, was caught and questioned. In the end, Joe and the mistress were released on the condition that they would not return to the area. But later, while investigating where Joe was living, the mistress discovered that he had been kicked out of both his home and his family house and was now living alone in an apartment near his company. The mistress barged into his apartment, resulting in a loud argument late at night. The mistress, who was supposed to be on maternity leave, stormed into the company in a furious rage, loudly talking about their affair and demanding alimony and child support, causing an uproar. As a result, Joe lost the trust of the company, was demoted from his managerial position, and is now treated like a pariah by everyone. She also was fired for causing a disturbance at the company, and feeling overwhelmed with the care of her child, she returned to her parents' home. Her parents learned the full story of what happened and came to apologize to me. Despite the incident, she was still their beloved daughter. The exhaustion was evident on their faces as they spoke of their intentions to care for their grandchild and firmly discipline their daughter. The mistress's parents were much more decent and kind than I had expected, and since they apologized profusely and paid the alimony on her behalf, we agreed to have no further involvement in the matter and ended the meeting that day. Three months after meeting the mistress's parents, I received a request from Joe through my lawyer to reconcile. I wanted to cut off contact entirely. But since Joe hadn't yet paid the alimony, I checked the message. Apparently, Joe couldn't handle the cold stares from his co-workers and jumped at the chance to take early retirement when it was offered last month. He mentioned that he was currently job hunting but was sure he'd find work soon, 
promising that he had learned his lesson and would help around the houses more and take care of Dad, pleading for reconciliation. If Joe had truly been remorseful, he wouldn't have turned defiant when the affair was discovered. He wouldn't have angrily contacted me when he found out the family home had been sold. I couldn't trust Joe's words anymore. He'd likely only learned his lesson temporarily, and after a while, he'd probably repeat the same mistakes. Besides, if he'd taken early retirement, he must have received a large sum of money. I wanted to get the alimony paid quickly and move on, so I declined Joe's request and demanded he pay the alimony. Unwilling to give up, Joe once again violated the order to go through the lawyer and showed up at my houses that night. Emily, please reconsider. I've reflected on everything. That woman, she's 32, and when younger women started joining the company, she stopped getting all the attention and turned to me. I tried to turn her down at first, but I never thought she'd get pregnant. I was a victim too. Joe, crying and shifting the blame to others, disgusted me. The only person I love is you, Emily. Please, let's start over. I'll do all the housework, even care for Dad. We can take A Dan on trips on our days off. He hadn't paid the alimony, hadn't found a new job, yet he could easily imagine a bright future. I felt no sympathy for Joe, who was desperately bowing his head. I've had enough. Pay the alimony immediately and leave. Emily! At that moment, A Dan appeared, having heard the commotion. Dad! Stop it. After everything you've done, it's too late to think you can just come back. Joe, feeling his pride wounded by his son's words, yelled at Aiden. Aiden, stay out of this. This is between your mom and me. Hearing Joe shout at Aiden, Bob finally emerged from the back room. Joe, how dare you speak like that? Not only have you troubled Emily, but you've also caused problems for a dent. Do you even realize how many people you've hurt? Having reached the point of no return, Joe began to cry and scream. This is my house. If you want me out, then you all leave. Hearing this, Bob went back to the room and returned with some documents. This house was built when you got married. Here's the property registry. It's in my name. This isn't your house. Now leave. Unable to say anything in response, Joe left the house, crying and shouting. After repeated demands from the lawyer, the alimony was finally paid. Since then, Joe hasn't contacted me, and I've started working part-time, living peacefully. I suggested that Bob continue living with me but he refused, not wanting to be a burden, and rented an apartment nearby. He arranged for the house ownership to be transferred from his name to mine, and now I live alone. Sometimes I feel lonely, but in those moments I visit Bob who lives nearby. He chose the nearby apartment so I could be there quickly if something happened, but I find myself visiting even when nothing is wrong. On Aden's days off, the three of us go out together. Recently, he's even started using care services. However, the care workers often remark that he hardly seems to need it, as he remains as energetic as ever, eating hearty meals that rival those of much younger people. Today is our monthly dinner outing with Bob, Aden, and me. As I waited at the station, I saw Bob waving as he approached. Hey, Grandpa's here. Aiden waved back at him. You look as energetic as ever, Bob. I'm glad. I can't let the young folks beat me just yet. I asked Bob, who was laughing heartily. What shall we eat today? Let's see. I'm in the mood for a big hamburger. Sounds good. 
I'll go for a mega hamburger too. Aiden and Bob started walking toward the diner. I glanced up at the sky and saw a clear, cloudless blue. I never imagined that I'd go through a divorce in my 50s. I thought infidelity was something that only happened in TV dramas. I was deeply saddened. I felt a lot of pain and frustration. But still, I have my irreplaceable family supporting me. I'm sure that the rest of my life will be as clear and bright as this sky. Wait up, you two. With a light heart, I chased after them, 